this morning, Job chapter 29, verses 1 through 12. And let's again read responsibly um, in this passage. I'll read on verse number 1, and then if you would, would you please join me on that second verse and every other verse down through verse number 12 here this morning in Job chapter 29. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me, when his candle shined upon my head, and when by his light I walked through darkness, as I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me, when I washed my steps with butter and the rock poured me out rivers of oil, when I went out to the gate through the city, when I prepared my seat in the street, the young men saw me and hid themselves, and the aged arose and stood up. The princes refrained talking and laid their hand on their mouth. The nobles held their peace, and their tongue cleaved to the roof of their mouth. When the ear heard me, then it blessed me, and when the eye saw me, it gave witness to me. Because I delivered the poor that cried, and the fatherless, and him that had none to help him. And thank you very much. You may be seated. Our Heavenly Father, just if you'll help me, I'll do my best to help the folks that I love this morning. Without your help, I won't be much help. So Lord, I once again ask you to help me. I think there's a lot of good things to be said today, but without your help, there would be meaningless. So Father, please help me. And then help all of us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was uh, very, very young, uh, the young people would always walk up to us and say, hey, what it is? You know, what it is, man. Well, then we sort of changed it around to say, well, what it was. <laughs> and then we changed it to, well, hey, what it could have been. You know, that's sort of one of those things. I guess one of the message uh, titles that I could have given this today would be what it was. But I didn't. I decided not to do that. I decided to give it something else. And if you're writing down a sermon title, it's called How It Used to Be, simply How It used to, be, used to Be. Many, if not most believers, are acquainted with Job's plight. The story of Job is very well known across all circles. It doesn't matter, young, old, uh, uh, Bible-believing, non-Bible-believing, the story of Job is very well known. And we know that before Job went through his great trial, this is something interesting that God said about him in Job chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, many, uh, it says this, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. I mean, that's the way the book starts. Four facts are given here. The Bible says, first of all, he was perfect. That didn't mean he was sinless. That means he was a very mature individual. He loved the Lord with all of his heart. The Bible says, secondly, he was upright. He lived an upright and unquestionably devoted life to the Lord. Thirdly, the Bible says he feared God. He took God at his word. He believed what God said. And today there are many who feel what God is, but they don't know what God says. And Job was a man who uh, feared God. And lastly, it says that he hated sin and ran from it. That's that little word eschewed. I've often described the word eschewed as that when evil would show its ugly face to Job, all it could see was elbows and heels because Job ran from it. He wasn't one that said, oh, I can handle this. He was one that said, I'm not even going to attempt to handle this. He said, I'm going to run from it. And uh, not only that, but the Bible says that Job had a family. He had 10 children, Job chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, and there was born unto him seven sons and three daughters. So he had a bunch of kids. Not only that, but the Bible says he was very possibly at that time, the, maybe the most prosperous or richest man, at least in that region, perhaps in the entire known world. The Bible says in Job 1, 3, it says, and his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. We find him to be a very rich, a very influential man. Job was a man whom God loved and wanted to display, put on display to show that old smutty faced Lucifer, the devil, whatever you'd like to call him by his name or by his other names. He wanted to show him that there was someone in the world who loved him absolutely wholly with his entire heart. 
and Job was a man that like that. However, God gave Lucifer permission to attack this perfect and mature man. And Satan was able to find exactly where Job was most vulnerable. I have said through the years that the devil always attacks you at your point of emphasis in your life. You're going to see it at the beginning of 2022, I'll guarantee it. Because there are many people, um, maybe many of you, who like New Year's resolutions. On, uh, on New Year's Eve, you'll be sitting up late bringing in the new year. And at midnight, you'll have that little list of resolutions that you want to do. You want to uh, read your Bible more. You want to lose weight. You want to travel more. You want to get rich. I don't know what your resolutions are, but there'll be a bunch of them. But you're going to find on some of those, like if you wanted to increase your prayer life or your soul winning or your Bible reading, you're going to find about February and March, it's going to fizzle out on you. And your resolution is going to go away. Why? Because that's your emphasis. You see, that is your, uh, that is your uh, point of emphasis. Someone says, well, I want, I want to lose 20 pounds or I want to lose this. Well, that's all going to work out real good till the next holiday comes up. And then you're going to blame it on the holiday. It says, well, there was Christmas and then there was New Year's and then there was Valentine's Day. And then there was my birthday and then there was this and all the food and all the, yeah, it, it's sort of like, yeah, that 20 pounds didn't go out the window. It sort of stayed where it was and all the rest of it. The devil always attacks at your point of emphasis. There will be some who say, I'm going to spend more time with my family and you're going to find your schedule doubling. Why? Because that's the last thing. that the, He doesn't want you to be successful in those areas. He wants you to do something else. In chapter 29, Job looks back on his life. And here's what he says. I want you to look what it says there. He wishes that things were the way that they used to be. Boy, do I hear that a lot. Oh, if only it could be like it was. Oh, if we could only go back 20 years, if we could only go back 10 years, if only we could go back before COVID, if only we could go do this. And they've got all these different things that they say. Well, that's no different than what Job said. Look what it says in Job 29 and verse 2. He says, oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me. Well, how were things before Job went through his great trial? The Bible lists them. He lists them right here. I've written them down. It's not the meat of my message, but I, I want you to see how it was in the days of old for him, what he longed for. He wanted to go back to those days. And hey, listen, I know I'm talking to all of us because some, many of us will say, only if I could go back before such and such. People are always asking the question, if you could change anything in your life, what would you change? Well, what do you do? You go back to a list. You go back to a list of things that if you had more wisdom at that time, you would do this differently. You would say this differently. You'd choose a different direction. You wouldn't do this. You wouldn't do that. We can learn number one. I'm going to read you the parts of the verses. You can just sort of glance at them there in Job 29. But first of all, he knew God's blessing. It says here that uh, when his candle shined upon my head. Secondly, he knew God's guidance. He says, by his light, I walk through darkness. Number three, uh, he was in his prime. He says, as I was in the days of my youth. You see, there are a lot of good things that happened with Job. And fourthly, he knew God's mind on matters. It says, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle. Wow, amazing statement. Number five, he said that God was with him. And look what it says. It says, the almighty was yet with me. Are you following down on the little verses there? I'm just taking snippets from each verse. Number six, his children were all alive. He said, my children were all about me. My children were all about me. Up at this point, remember, he had already had all 10 children were dead. He had lost all of his children. He said, there was a time when I had kids all around me. My children were all around me. The Bible goes on to tell here in number seven that he walked in the abundance of God's sweet blessing. He says, when I, wa when I washed my steps with butter and the rock poured out, upon, uh, poured out rivers of oil. It's talking about God's blessing upon him. He knew the sweet blessing of God. The words that he uses are beautiful words and pictures that he gives. Eight, he was a community leader. That was interesting. He had prospered in the community because he sat in his seat uh, at the gate of the city. Uh, he was nine. He was revered by young men. And while young and old, both stood in his presence. Amazing. He was blessed with those people that would come to him. All this is found written here as he wrote about it. 
Uh, Princes uh, could not speak in his presence, and nobles held their peace when standing before him. A great deal of respect that they had for this man. We're not done reading how it was before. He says, I just wish it was like that way again. If I could go back, that's what I would want. Number 11, it says that God used him to bless those who, were, who needed blessing. And he delivered the poor and the fatherless and those that had nobody to help them. He was there to help them all along. When you're the richest man in the East, you've got plenty of resources to help those who have much less. Number 12, he gave hope to the hopeless and caused the widow's heart to sing, he went on to say. You know, a lot of folks have nothing much to look forward to. He gave them something to look forward to. He blessed them. Number 13, his eye, he was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame and a father to the poor. Amazing how it says what he did. You don't want to talk about philanthropy. This man was it in his day. And then lastly, that I want to give you about him before his tragedy came. Uh, he was a righteous judge and planned to live a long life. That's what his plans were. Amazing man. When you read about Job, and most of the things that we know about Job are not these things. The things that we know about Job is that uh, the first few verses in Job chapter 1, and then we get into chapters 2 and 3, and we learn that the Lord set him up for a trial with Lucifer himself. He lost his health, he lost all of his children, he lost all of his servants, he lost all of his, uh, his animals. Everything that he owned, the buildings were blown down with a tornado or whatever it was that came. And all, he lost everything, amazing, he even lost the loyalty of his own wife. As she looked at him, he said, well, why don't you just curse God and die? It doesn't seem like God's blessing you. Well, you know, and of course, don't be too mad at Mrs. Job. I mean, the wives usually suffer more than their husbands do often anyway. I mean, the husband says, eh, no big deal. Wife says, what do you mean no big deal? Of course it's a big deal. It may not be a big deal to you, but it's a big deal to me. But she did look at him and she said, just curse God and die. In the depths of despair, all these things that we read a moment ago are in his past now. Nothing is present with him. And uh, Job, uh, from what I read, Job was in the clutches of the devil's destroying hands by God's own permission. You think about it, the Bible says that he was plagued with boils from the top of his head to the sole of his feet. He would sit in the warm ashes of the fire, not in the fire, of course, but in the warm ashes and take a piece of broken pottery. And there he would, uh, he would those sores and those boils that were all over his body, he would scrape them with that just to find a little bit of relief, just to try to find some relief. He had three friends who came and sat with him without saying a word for an entire week. What a blessing, huh? You know, sometimes you just need somebody to sit with you. You don't need them to say anything. So for seven days, they didn't say anything. Then after seven days, they laid into him. They said, this is your fault. God's mad at you. You've blown it with the Lord. I mean, their advice may have been sound in some areas, but there are some things it's better not to say. Their seven days of silence was what Job needed, not their next little while of, of advice that was given, putting all the entire blame on him. And when you read it, none of it should have been on him as a blame. They blamed the Lord because the Lord said to the devil, he said, because remember, Lucifer had access to the throne uh, in heaven, and, and uh, the Lord said, where have you been? As if he didn't know. And Lucifer said, well, I've been out in the earth looking around, checking people out, looking at them, beholding all these things. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? Wow. Have you considered my servant Job? I don't know if he had or not, but up to that point, maybe he hadn't. And then God described Job to Lucifer, and Lucifer says, I can make him fall. I can make him cuss you out. I can make him curse your name. And the Lord, it happened twice, and the Lord said, you can do whatever you want, just don't kill him. And he lived through it. And the Bible says in all of that, he did not say anything foolishly against the Lord. I'm sure the devil was disappointed. I'm sure he was. And, but oh, how Job wanted it to be how it was just a few months ago. That's what he wanted. And listen, Job is not too far removed from any of us. We look back over the last year, we look back over our lives, and many people say, if only I could do such and such, or if I could be this old again and know what I know now. Well, that's dumb. You can't know what you know now if you're back in the age that you once were. But we often say, and many people will say, if only it could be like it used to be. If only it could be like it was. 
you know, and what do we say to parents about their children? They grow up so fast. And we miss the little voices. Yesterday, Brother Penn let me watch a little bit of a video that he took a long time ago when they were living up in Woodland Park. And I said, don't you just love the little voices that the children have, the little tiny voices that they have? And now they're all grown up and got different voices. But when they were little, their voices were just sweet and cute and all that. And I don't know that I want to go back to those days, but those are sweet memories. I said last week, the past is a great place to visit, but it's no place to live. The past is a great place to visit, but it is no place to live. What we find here about him, and I'll, I'll get to the meat of my message in just a moment, but he wanted the blessings back. And, and so he complained to God and told God how good uh, he was. Uh, before, in chapter 29, Job is sad because, while thinking about the past prosperity that he had in his life. In chapter 30, if you were to go on and read, he's sorrowful as he describes his present misery. And he was in a great deal of misery. Nobody can argue with that. You can't say, oh, it's not that bad. It was bad for Job. It was bad for Job. And then you get into chapter 31, and he is very solemn in his declaration of his innocence. He's, you know, I don't deserve this. I shouldn't have this happen to me. A king in the Bible named Hezekiah said basically the same thing when he was going through a difficult time. But often believers wish they could have it the way it used to be, uh, just like Job wanted it like it used to be. Ah, I remember such and such. Uh, I've known Christians, the only thing they say in conversation is, do you remember when? <laughs> All they have is the past to live in. They don't count the blessings of the day. When I think about that, what kind of man wished it could be how it used to be? It was a backslidden man at this time, one who let something happen to him where he thought, I don't deserve this. I've had people tell me, I didn't sign up for this. If I would have known this was going to happen, I would have never signed up to do this in the Christian life. No. Why? Because you think that you don't deserve it or whatever? I don't know. Maybe we have this, this, this syndrome to where woe is me, the whole world is against me. It was a backslidden man who thought he didn't deserve what he was getting. He suffered the loss of his children. He suffered the loss of his servants. He suffered the loss of his buildings. He suffered the loss of his animals. He suffered the loss of his wife's loyalty. He suffered with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, the Bible says. And he had to sit and listen to the criticism of three people, three men who came. Like I said, for seven days they didn't say anything, but then they laid into him. Then they laid into him. And after all, how could a loving God allow such cruel things to happen to such a good man? The people ask that all the time about the Lord, don't they? How could a loving God do such and such? How could God allow this in my life? Doesn't he know that I love him? How could he allow death or how could he allow sickness? How could he allow cancer? How could he allow some kind of a horrible thing to happen in a person's life? People are always asking God things like that. Probably everybody in this room at one time or another has asked God something like that. Well, what happened to Job? Listen very carefully. You're not going to want to miss the rest of the message. Job took his eyes off of God for a while, and he put them upon his own circumstances. Another man in the Bible by the name of the Apostle Peter, you know the story of the Apostle Peter. And the Bible says that Jesus was out walking on the water, uh, something that we don't do. And the people on the boat including Peter, looked and they thought it might have been a, a ghost or a spirit out on the water. And uh, they were afraid. And uh, Jesus said, it's me. And Peter said, well, if it's really you, bid me to come out and walk on the water with you. Well, Peter did something that day that none of us have ever done. He did walk on the water. He stepped out of the boat right into the water. But the Bible says when he took his eyes off of Jesus and the circumstances around him, he began to sink. And before he went under, he said, Lord, save me. And Jesus, from where he was, came and pulled Peter up out of the water, and they both walked back to the boat. Now, that's something none of us have ever done. But you know, the interesting thing was, Peter could have walked all the way out to where Jesus was if he hadn't taken his eyes off of him. So you believe that? Of course I do. Well, don't you? I mean, that's just the plain, simple fact of the matter. 
Had he not taken his eyes off of Jesus, he could have walked right out to where he was and they could have walked all the way back to the boat. But no, he says he looked at the waves around him and the boisterous wind and all that. And the Bible says as soon as he did that, he started to sink. Doesn't take you long to go under. But Jesus was right there to fetch him out of the water, which of course he did. You see, Job was a man who had raised a godly family. He was successful in his life. He had everything going his way. And he ended up saying something like this, why was all this happening to me? Why me? Years ago, a song came out, which I don't like, called Why Me, Lord? But the song is about, what did I do to get your blessing? But he's now saying, why me? I mean, I've, I've done things right. Why me? Well, why not you? Job, was com- he, Joseph, Job, Job compared himself to those around him. If you have your Bible there, I want you to see what it says. And if you don't have it, just listen very carefully. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, he did what the New Testament pretty much condemns. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. I don't deserve this. So-and-so is worse than I am. How come I have to suffer this and they don't? Well, God, why are you using them and not me? I know how they live. Well, God knows how you live. Don't ever forget that. But what we do is we start comparing ourselves and our, our station in life to those around us. And we wonder why God is so unfair. I just want to say God is not fair and never has been fair. God is just. And he knows what's best for all of us, you see. We have four kids. We love them all the same. We didn't treat them all the same. For example, my oldest son, we had a, we had a board with a, with a Texas tack in the end of it for him. And then I had a daughter for her. We had a 10-penny nail in the end of hers. And then my, uh, my, my next son, we had a, had a little uh, uh, roofing nail for him. And for my youngest son, we had a tack meaning they all got disciplined, but they all needed different discipline. All that to simply say, uh, one son, we had to use the Texas tax, so to speak, and the other one, all we had to do was look at sideways, and they were in tears, okay? You love them all the same, but you treat them differently. You know, God knows what you need. There's a, prayers that, there's a prayer that I pray every single day for people that I know, and I say, Lord, you know what it's going to take to change their heart. Lord, do what it takes, because I don't know what it'll take. They're headed down a road, Lord, that's uh, uh, the wrong road will always lead them to the wrong place. And they're headed down the wrong road. Lord, do what it takes to change them for your honor, for your glory. Because I don't know what it's going to take. No, I did not have four paddles that had nails in them for my kids. That's just an illustration. And by the way, my children are very thankful that I didn't, just so you know. But Job started comparing himself to others, just like what we do sometimes. Lord, I've been faithful. This is what I've done. So-and-so is not. And look at their lives and look at mine. I don't understand that. They have all the money and the needs met that they have, and I'm having financial difficulties. I don't understand this. We've got to be careful that we don't start comparing ourselves to others. By his own estimation, he wasn't nearly as bad as those around him, and especially his three friends who offered him advice during that time. He became like the Pharisee whom the Bible says in Luke chapter 18, verses 11 and 12. Let me read it for you. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, says, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as the publican, I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. Boy, he was something, wasn't he? But his phrase was, I thank thee that I am not as other men. And Job sort of developed that because, by the way, he did stand. And he did what was right for the longest time. But like so many of us, he got full of himself. Job did not think he deserved what came his way. And he says, if only it could be like it used to be. If only it could be like it was. In case you're wondering, I've said that just like you have. If only it could be like it once was. But I'm glad that God did not answer that prayer for me. There are some lessons for us to remember because what Job expressed is something that affects all of us. I want to give you five points and we're done. Number one, 
the best thing that we deserve is not heaven, but hell. Sinners, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. We're all sinners. The Bible says, listen to me now, don't miss this. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible goes on to say in Romans 5.12, it says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We're all sinners. One, years ago, I was in charge of a, uh, of a children's church program in a very large church. And uh, one of my preacher boys, one of my young men in my, in my youth group, got up and preached a sermon one time to the junior church kids. He brought in two balls of mud. And he had one of them with a little wig on and eyes and put lips on it with some lipstick and made it look really nice, but it was still a ball of mud. And he had another ball of mud that wasn't quite as good. I mean, it was just all disheveled and, you know, as bad as mud can look and all that. And he says, one hunk of mud doesn't have the right to judge another hunk of mud. The kids got the, got the message. But see, we're all sinners. Some of us might be dress nicer or act nicer or more educated or come from a better family or whatever, and the other one may have everything going against him, but we're all still mud. The Bible says we're all sinners, end of report. And there are no exceptions. And then the Bible goes on to say in Romans 6.23, it says the wages of sin is death. We all deserve hell, not heaven. I don't, I've never met anybody that sincerely said, oh, I deserve heaven. Oh, you can want to give it. I deserve it. I came to know the Lord when I was eight years of age, and I'm here to, I'm, all these years, I'm here to tell you, I still don't deserve heaven. I still don't deserve it. It was a gift that was given. He said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and I did, and he did, and that was all it took. But this ball of mud wasn't just like every other ball of mud. The best we deserve is hell. As I witnessed to that older lady, I told you this story before, but as I witnessed to her, she listened to the entire way to go to heaven, and I started to review, and she said, oh, I don't believe I deserve hell. She said, I don't believe in hell. I said, really? And I said, she said, no. I said, Jesus did. I said, so you're smarter than Jesus? You don't believe in hell, but he did? She said, well, 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 she said, no. She said, it's not that I don't believe in it. She said, I just don't believe it's for me, no matter what the Bible says. Number two, God knows what he's doing. He is not like we are who guess at what we do. You realize God loves you, and listen, God loves you. He wants what's best for you. Think about this. He's all-knowing, and he knows what's best for you. And not only that, but he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's able to do what's best for you. God knew what was best for Job. Job needed to learn this lesson and would never have learned it any other way. Number three, we are filled with too much pride to accept what God allows in our lives. And, and what I say by that is, rather than, we often say, I don't deserve this. This should have never happened to me. I've been a faithful servant of the Lord. I've been going to church. I've been doing all these wonderful things. I'm, I give to the poor. And just like what Job was saying though, that he did. But the truth of the matter is, we're, often we are filled with too much pride to accept what comes our way. The Apostle Paul, he gave us 14 books in the New Testament. The Bible. Some people have said the Apostle Paul was the greatest Christian who ever lived. I don't know that I believe that. But he was a pretty good one. Interesting thing about the Apostle Paul, he was just like a ball of mud, just like I am. And God used him in a wonderful and a mighty way. But the truth is, when God sent a trial into his life, he had problems with his eyes. Can you imagine a preacher having problems with his eyes? Some people say they believe that he suffered from an eye disease called ophthalmia. His eyes would swell and get all, I wouldn't even decide, just gross things. His eyes would just terribly infected and one time he wrote a, one of his epistles and he talked about a large letters that he wrote with and why that's so he could see them it wasn't a long letter that he wrote either it was a short little book that he wrote in the bible but it had big letters in it so that he could read it and here's what he said he said god i don't deserve this 
If I, if I would have known you were going to take away my sight, I would have never become what you wanted me to become. He didn't say that at all. He said, I asked God three times to take it away. I wanted God to heal me. I asked him three times. And God answered him and said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And the Apostle Paul then said these words, I will most gladly rather therefore glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He accepted what God sent his way. What a great blessing that was. When I think about that, I think about our own Joanna, who's now been in heaven for eight years. Her little plaque is out there on the wall. When you're on your way out, you need to read the verse that she put in there. Her desire was that whether by life or by death, she would bring glory and honor to God. That became her cancer verse of all things. And you know, she didn't die, die bitter and angry. I remember what her sister told me as they were sitting on the couch shortly before she died. Uh, Joanna was sitting on one end of the couch and she heard her whisper under her breath. She said, I love you, God. I love you, God. She was dying. I said, I love you, God. You know, being able to accept the circumstances that God brings or allows into our lives is a wonderful thing. Number four, everything that comes to us, first of all, is filtered through the very hands of God. Many years ago, we had an older couple came to our church. They never became members, but they loved attending here. Their names were Penn, just like Brother and Mrs. Penn. Their name were Penn. And I remember she had a real deep southern accent. And I mean a southern accent, okay? I mean, she called somebody and she'd say, hello, and they'd say, deposit 25 more cents, please, because it was such a long hello, you know. And uh, she had a real deep southern, southern drawl. She looked at me one day and she said, Pastor, she said, the trials, everything that comes into our life is father filtered. I'll never forget her saying that, father filtered. It has to go through his hands before it comes to me. Wow. You talk about an interesting good lesson that your pastor needed to hear. Number five, and lastly, Job was not right with God when he made this complaint. And perhaps there is a parallel here for those of us who complain about the same kinds of things. Maybe what we need to do is trust the Lord. I like what Job said. He said, though he slay me, he didn't say, yet will I trust him to heal me. He said, though, he said I will not, I'm not trusting him to bring my children back. I'm not trusting him to bring my riches back. He did not, here's what he said. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And there are many today who trust the Lord to do something rather than just trusting him to do what he does best, which is be God. And you know, the Lord's good at what he does. The Bible says very plainly, it says, as for God, his way is perfect. Everything about him. In Psalm 119, verse 68, it says, thou art good and doest good. It didn't say thou art good because I have food on my table. It does not say thou art good because I have gasoline in my automobile. He did not say thou art good because my bills are paid. He did not say thou art good because I have my health. All he simply said was, and that was King Hezekiah, as he had been captured by Sennacherib and Rabshakeh, and he was there as Jerusalem had been besieged, and he wrote these words, and he says, Thou art good and doest good. That's why he was a prisoner. Even the Apostle Paul, while he was sitting in prison, wrote these words, and he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. We need to get off our high horses and just let God be God and quit thinking we don't deserve. The truth of the matter is, if we got what we deserve, none of us would be here today. That's for sure. Perhaps God's people would live more contentedly in their present situation if they would only stop comparing themselves and the life they're living to how things used to be. Some people just always living in the past. What a terrible place to live. You can't go forward if you're living in the past. You, if you were to come to my house and you were to look in our little hall closet, from the top shelf almost to the bottom, there are slide trays filled with photographs that I've taken over the years. That's a nice thing to do in review. My children hated it. Holiday time, we pull out the slides, get out the slide projector. Okay, Dad's going to show us slides again. But I like them. 
If you were to go downstairs into the little office area that we have there, we have shelves filled with photo albums. Nice place to visit. It is. But I don't live there. I live here and now. I go back and I count the blessings. And I see some of the hard times that the Lord brought us through. And I visit there just ever so often. Facebook has this thing that people participate in. I've done it before because our church has this page. It's called Throwback Thursday. One of my friends calls it Throw Up Thursday because he prints all the bad pictures from his past. It's terrible. But every now and then I'll put up something about when I was a little kid, some blessing that we had. Throwback Thursday. Not a problem. But I don't live there. I don't live there. The truth of the matter is, for Job, as important as his past was, it was unimportant now. It did not matter what he was a few months ago. What truly mattered was what was going on in his life right that moment. And he could not live in the sweet by and by, and he found it distasteful to live in the nasty now and now. Just listen. The the way it used to be made him hate the way it was. But he couldn't, you can't change the past. There's nothing you can do about the past. You can't bring it back. God has a will for each and every one of us, just as God had a will for Job. The Apostle Paul penned the following concerning that subject in Romans chapter 9. Let me read it to you, and then I'll be done. The Apostle Paul said, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault for Who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hast hast not the potter the power over the clay, or the same lump to make one vessel into honor and another to dishonor? The Apostle Paul says we really don't have the right to question God about his wisdom. We do, and I'm not going to say I don't. But God knows what he's doing. And you know what? As I look back over the last two years of what has happened in our country, as I look back over this ministry over the last 31 years, God has known what he was doing every single turn. He's never made a mistake. I've made plenty, but he has not made any. And the truth of the matter is, rather than becoming prideful, we need to understand that God will always do what's right by us for his will in our lives. And we need to do what Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. You've got to remember that God has a will for you today, and it may not include everything that it used to be. Job got right with God, and so can we. He did, by the way. Job got right with God. The Lord sent to him a young man who got tired of listening to everybody criticizing Job. One of my favorite Bible characters is a fellow you need to look up. His name is Elihu. If I, why did they name him Elihu? I mean, of all things. And he had a Popeye moment with Job. Remember when Popeye would say, I've had all I can stands and I can't stands no more? Well, that's what Elihu basically said. He said, I've had it. He said, you guys be quiet. And he laid into Job. And I thought, and then after he got done straightening Job out, God said, move over, Elihu. I've got some things I want to say to Job too. And God basically said, can you make dirt? Can you make grass? Can you make anything? He says, let me tell you about what I'm working in your life. Job got it right by the end of the book. It took him a while, but he got it right. And so that's my message today. How it used to be. Past is a good place to visit. Visit it as often as you want, but whatever you do, don't build a house there. It's not a good place to live. Where you are right now, God has allowed it or brought it. And it's good for us. If we will let the Lord work in our lives, rather than being bitter or angry over anything that God may allow in our lives, And rather than saying, you sure aren't very just to me, you don't like me very much. No, we'll be mad at the one. Just remember, most of our problems are caused by us anyway. And uh, the Lord, he can can do what's right by us. Our Heavenly Father, I am so thankful.